All right, in part two of chapter 17 on the heart, we'll continue by looking at a little bit of review. Um, you should have already covered a little bit of the cardiac muscle histology in 168, but uh, just, just a few things um, for review about cardiac muscle cells. One is that uh, they generally just have one centrally located nucleus. That's, that's different if you remember from skeletal uh, muscle fibers because they can have, they're multinucleate. Uh, they're also very rich in myoglobin. This is a special type of hemoglobin that helps to bind to oxygen uh, even better. And so that provides a lot of oxygen, oxygen supply to the um, cardiac muscle cells. They're very rich in mitochondria. And of course, that means that they you know, would generate a lot of ATP. Um, these are striated, and that just kind of refers to the pattern, pattern of actin and myosin um, um, myofilaments that are inside the make of the muscle tissue. So you can see the striations when you look at the histology. And they also have intercalated discs that help to connect these cells. And that allows for very quick, very fast uh, cell to cell communication. So electrical signals um, must be able to pass very quickly between cells. And they do that because the, of the intercalated discs. You can see these on the diagram, the kind of zigzag uh, areas here that connect cells cells to cells and those intercalated discs um, um, include desmosomes and gap junctions. Desmosomes, if you remember from 168, kind of adhere the cells together. The proteins that kind of um, help the cells bind together. And then the gap junctions are the openings or the almost like tunnels that allow for electrical signals to pass very quickly um, through the heart tissue, through the heart cells and the, and the tissue. Now, the next uh, main section talks about the what's called the conduction system of the heart, and we need to look at a couple of different pacemaker cells. Uh, the first group of cells are what are called the SA node. This is a collection of cells um, in the right atrium of the heart, known as the sinoatrial node or the SA node. Um, these cells function as a pacemaker because they are basically autorhythmic. Um, they can stimulate um, uh, automatically uh, themselves to contract at a regular interval and it's usually about 60 to 70 beats per minute. This is basically where the action potential originates and we'll kind of trace that action potential through the heart and see how it causes the atria to contract and then eventually the ventricles to contract. There is a second node and this this is a good diagram of the heart and the conduction system of the heart. First of all, we'll go ahead and look at the SA node in the picture. Uh, the SA node is at the upper portion of the right atrium, and this is where the action potential is generated. So it generates the electrical signal that's going to stimulate the heart to contract. And then there is a secondary node, an atrioventricular node, um, which is right along the border between the right atrium and the right ventricle. This beats a little slower, so this slows down the rhythm of the heart to about 40 to 50 beats per minute. Once these action potentials are generated, these signals go through the heart muscle in a, in a uh, directed format known as the Purkinje fiber system. So they follow a path, and so the first place that they'll go is down through uh, what's called the AV bundle. They go through, here's the ventricular septum. Uh, interventricular septum, the wall that separates the two ventricles. And so that signal then travels down through here. Actually, first of all, it goes from the right atrium. There's a, a signal that passes over to the left atrium. So your right atrium and your left atrium contract almost simultaneously. And then that signal then passes through that AV node and then down the interventricular septum, there is a branch there. And so one branch will come over to the right side of the heart and will stimulate um, the right ventricle contr to contract. And then the other branch goes over to the left side of the heart and stimulates the left ventricle to contract. Now, the uh, figure 17.13 uh, um, goes over a little bit of the action potentials um, and um, that's specific to cardiac muscle cells. And so, if you need a little review on this, um, you can look back in your in your textbook and for bio, you know when you cover by 168 when you covered the action potential generation from uh, skeletal muscle cells, and so there are some similarities here, but there are a couple of differences we need to point out about what happens differently in cardiac muscle cells compared to skeletal muscle.
And so first of all, uh, in either one, there is a rapid depolarization, that's step one. Here you see the cell membrane. You've got a couple of different ion channels here. Here's your sodium, um, sodium channel. This is a gated channel, voltage gated channel. Here's potassium channels. Um, and then we'll eventually get to the calcium channels. But the first thing in any action potential is, remember you have to reverse the charges. And so usually a cell is gonna be um, more negative on the inside of the cell and more positive on the outside of the cell because you have all these positive sodium ions. So the action potential is generated whenever this gate opens and that causes a lot of these sodium ions to influx into the internal side of the cell. And so that's depicted here. Remember the resting membrane potential is somewhere around minus 85 or so. That's very similar to what a skeletal muscle cell would be. And then you have a rapid depolarization. So as soon as that gate opens, that sodium starts to flood inside of the cell. And that's why this number, this graph shows it becoming very um, positive very, very quickly. Then um, it begins to repolarize just like a skeletal muscle cell would. And that repolarization is caused whenever the potassium channels open up and that potassium starts to leak back out and you start uh, to decrease some of that positive ions in your inside of the cell. And that's seen as that, that graph line starts to drop back down. But in cardiac muscle, there's an additional step here called the plateau phase. And so that's indicated uh, because of this calcium ion channel. Calcium begins to go inside of the cell that, that prolongs uh, the depolarization phase. And so it allows the, um, the inside of the cell to remain positive uh, longer. And so there is a time lag here. You can kind of see on the, on the graph here, it stays in the positive territory much longer. Then eventually the calcium channel closes and then the potassium channels, they open, you know, they continue opening and they allow all of that to return back to the resting membrane potential. So you have a lag phase, a delayed phase, what's called the plateau phase here and that's because of the calcium channel. That plateau phase does three things um, for, the heart, for the heart muscle. One is it slows down the heart rate. By having, that, uh, by having that plateau phase that provides enough time that's required for each of the chambers of the heart to go through the filling phase, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the chapter. So it slows down the heart rate. Having that plateau, having the calcium there, slows down and, and slowing down the depolarization, um, slowing down the repolarization will help to slow down the heart rate. Number two, it actually helps the heart muscle contract a little uh, with greater force. By having a plateau phase, it, it pauses the contraction phase for a little bit and it allows the heart muscle to contract um, with a little greater force. And then the last thing is it lengthens, it prolongs what's called the refractory period. The definition is up there for you, the time during which some kind of excitable cell, in this case, the cardiac muscle cell, cannot be stimulated to contract again. This helps to keep the heart, the cardiac muscles in the heart, uh, contracting on time and in synchronization. Now, the other thing that you can look at with the uh, conduction system of the heart is what's called the EKG or electrocardiogram. And so this is basically picking up the electrical signals, which are basically your action potentials, trying to map out or graph the action potentials in the heart. And uh, of course, it's used in diagnostics to look at uh, cardiac physiology and look for abnormal abnormalities. And uh, the three main waves that you can look at um, are the P wave, QRS wave, the QRS complex, and then the uh, T wave. I'm just going to briefly go over a few of these things and kind of indicate on the graph what what each one is representative of. The first one is a P wave. You can see it there on the graph. This is the first wave uh, on an EKG, and it's also the smallest wave here. Um, this rep is representative of the first um, action potential that you have, which is going to be a picture of what's taking place in the atria. So this represents depolarization of the atria. So if you remember from the conduction system uh, picture we looked at, the first thing, you know, the, the SA node is inside of the right atrium, so that's where depolarization begins. And so the P wave is representative of the depolarization of both the right and left atria. Uh, 
the QRS complex, um, after the atria receive the action potential and they become depolarized, then the ventricles, remember the Purkinje fiber system, it goes down and it, and it splits off and it goes around the ventricles and it carries that action potential around the ventricles so they become depolarized. And so that's what's taking place in the QRS. Now, in addition to that, the atria um, are being repolarized. Remember, for every action potential, you'll have a depolarization event and a repolarization event. And so here for the QRS, um, the P wave is where the atria are depolarized and they are repolarized out here somewhere in the QRS. Um, it just happens to the, the depolarization of the ventricles kind of overshadows the repolarization of the end on the graph of the atria. Then the T wave is where the ventricles become repolarized. So again, the ventricles are depolarized in the QRS region of the graph, and then they become repolarized in the T wave region of the graph. If you want some more practice looking at um, the EKGs, you can, uh, there's a nice website called skillstat.com and you can go there and you can practice uh, uh, lots of different um, anomalies, lots of different arrhythmias of the heart and you can see what the pattern looks like and uh, even uh, do like a little test or quiz. All right, the next section talks about what's called the cardiac cycle. And um, basically, as we know, the heart is two main pumps working together. In other words, you've got contraction and relaxation. I've got a couple of vocabulary words for you. Um, contraction is systole and relaxation is diastole. And so um, the other statement, the last statement there is that blood, because of the blood pressure, is always going to go from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So understanding a few of these things helps us to understand what the cardiac cycle is all about. There's four main phases here that we'll look at. And the textbook does a good job of showing you some diagrams. And so that's what I have here. Uh, step one is called ventricular filling. You could start the cardiac cycle in any phase. They just started here with the filling phase. And so it is what it sounds like. It's where the ventricles fill up with blood. And of course, uh, now that we understand the blood flow through the heart, we know that that blood is coming from the atria. So if you look on the right side of the heart, here's your right atrium. You know, it's received blood from every, everywhere in the body, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. And as it relaxes, blood starts coming down into the ventricles. And so that's ventricular filling phase. Number two is isovolumetric contraction phase. That sounds uh, very complicated, but really it's not too complicated. Iso means equal, and volumetric is how much blood, flow, uh, blood there is, and so this means equal volume of blood. Um, it is contraction, so uh, as it points out here, ventricular systole begins. So again, if you want to look at the right side of the heart, what this means is the right ventricle has started to contract. It's starting to build up pressure. That causes the um, tricuspid valve here, uh, to close, so no more blood is coming from the right atrium anymore. The tricuspid valve is closed. You're building up pressure here, but you haven't changed volumes yet because you haven't built up enough pressure to push open the semilunar valve here in the pulmonary trunk. So eventually, you're going to have you know enough pressure built up here to eject the blood out. But but at this stage, at stage two, isovolumetric contraction phase, you haven't built up enough pressure which means step three is ventricular ejection. You have built up enough pressure here, so vent the ventricles continue to contract. So ventric uh, ventricular systole continues. So if you look at the right ventricle, it continues to contract, it builds up pressure. It finally uh, builds up enough pressure and that um, pushes open the semilunar valve, uh, either in the pulmonary trunk or the aortic um, valve here, whichever side you're looking at and it pushes open that valve and that ejects the blood out of that vessel. Now, there's a definition here for you before we go to step four. Um, that pressure that the ventricles need to, um, uh, to eject the blood out of the pulmonary trunk or out of the aorta is a special, uh, is, a, is a terminology here, vocab word for you, it's called afterload. And so just kind of put, make a flashcard on that understand what afterload is, is how much pressure it takes each of the ventricles to create, uh, to have in order to eject that blood up and get it past the semilunar valve. 
So then the last phase is, is phase four. This is called isovolumetric relaxation. So this is diastole. Diastole is relaxation of the chambers. And so um, isovolumetric, again, that's going to be um, you know, equal volume. And so that means volume really doesn't change at this point. Um, but the ventricles are relaxing at this point. Notice that all of the valves are closed at this point. And so no blood flow, you know, blood flow is not moving any direction at this point. Um, and so this is the last stage. This is right before the filling phase. And so after step four, you would start back with the cardiac cycle in step one, which would be the filling phase. Now we need to look at a few uh, things about blood pressure. And so um, we'll look at what's called the mean arterial pressure. This is the average blood pressure found in the aorta. And there's an equation here for you. Um, MAP, or mean arterial pressure, is a function of these two things, cardiac output and PR, which is peripheral resistance. So let's look at each one of these, and I'll kind of show you how the equation works. Um, cardiac output is defined, it's a volume, first of all, it's a volume. Uh, it's the amount of blood pumped by the heart every minute. And so, um, um, and then peripheral resistance is what it sounds like. It's how much resistance um, that the blood is, um, has to be pumped through, how much resistance against, against which the blood is pumped. And so the equation works like kind of like this. You have a map on one side, you have blood pressure on one side, and then you have cardiac output and resistance on the other side of the equation. And so what that means, if one side of the equation goes up, the other side is also going to increase. So in other words, if cardiac output increases, the pressure here is increasing. Or if peripheral resistance increases, that causes the MAP or the mean arterial pressure to increase. So let's look at a scenario here. Cardiac output, though, um, is a function of two things of its own. It's a function of the stroke volume, and it's also a function of the heart rate. The stroke volume, by definition, is how much blood is pumped uh, every time a ventricle contracts. Right? So every time the heart beats, uh, that's the stroke volume. How much blood is pumped? Again, this is a volume. How much blood is pumped every time the heart beats? And because cardiac output has a time factor associated with it, then we have to look at heart rate. Heart rate is how many times the, the heart beats uh, in a minute. And so here, you know, at rest, these are just some uh, average numbers here. But um, at rest, in general, the stroke volume is usually about 70 milliliters per beat. So about 70 milliliters of blood gets pumped out of the, out of the ventricle every time it contracts. Heart rate, obviously that changes, but maybe at rest, um, the heart rate may be somewhere around 60 to 70 you know, beats a minute. If we assume these two numbers, then we can calculate cardiac output. And so to do that, you just substitute in the equation for stroke volume, 70 milliliters per, per beat up here at SV. For heart rate, you put 72 uh, beats per minute. You multiply those two numbers and you get 5,040 milliliters per minute. And then you can adjust the value if you want to. You can change it to liters. That's what I did. And so 5,040 is very close to about 5,000, I mean, uh, five liters, sorry, five liters of blood per minute. That is the cardiac output given the stroke volume is 70 and the heart rate is 72. Now, there are a few factors. There's actually three we'll talk about, factors that influence stroke volume. The first one is called preload. Uh, preload is how much stretch that you have inside of the ventricular walls. So think about what would cause the ventricle walls to stretch. Well, that would be the blood flow. How much blood flow is returning back to the heart? That is the preload. And so there's something called the uh, Frank Starlin's Law of the Heart. This is just a scenario where if you had an increased amount of stretch, meaning you had extra, you know, more blood flow returning back to the heart, you've got maybe you're overhydrated, you've got higher, you know, you're retaining fluids, and you've got extra blood flow returning back to the heart, then that puts pressure on the ventricles, it causes the ventricles to stretch, and then that causes a reflex action in the heart, and that causes the heart muscle to contract with greater force, 
when the heart contracts with greater force, that increases the stroke volume, how much blood is coming out of the ventricle stroke volume. Another factor that influences stroke volume is, is heart rate, or how the heart contracts or con contractility. All of these kind of mean the same thing. The heart's pumping ability, contractility, or the heart rate. If you increase the heart rate, that also tends to increase the contraction force that also increases stroke volume. Then the third thing that affects stroke volume is afterload. Remember, afterload is how much pressure that the ventricle has to have, has to generate to eject the blood up through the semilunar valve. Well, if that pressure increases, then that means that stroke volume is going to decrease. So these are um, basically opposite of each other. These are inversely related. So if something causes the afterload to increase, maybe there's extra pressure in the aorta, you know, pushing down on that semilunar valve. And so it's causing the heart to have to generate much you know, higher pressure, a higher afterload to try to push that blood up and out of the aorta, then that would mean that the stroke volume would decrease. Also with uh, regulating uh, cardiac output, you can also look at the nervous system because the nervous system does play a role in the heart and the heart rate. And so especially the sympathetic nervous system um, because of the cardiac uh, nerves coming from the brain. And here, uh, basically your uh, sympathetic stimulation of the S8 and AV nodes will cause the heart rate to increase and will cause the force of contraction to increase. So your nervous system can cause um, a change and help to regulate cardiac output. Increase the heart rate, increase the force of contraction. That means cardiac output uh, increases because it's increasing stroke volume. So that causes cardiac output to increase. The parasympathetic stimulation, usually parasympathetic slows things down. And that's kind of what's happening here. Uh, there's a nerve called the vagus nerve. This is uh, one of the cranial nerves that goes through the heart. Um, and it has an in inhibitory effect. It actually slows down the heart rate. And the reason this happens is because it releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine that actually uh, during the depolarization phase, um, I'm sorry, during the repolarization phase, it actually hyperpolarizes the heart. So it goes even more negative than it normally does. And that slows down the next um, contraction. And so that slows down the action potential for the next contraction. So parasympathetic slows down the heart, whereas sympathetic speeds up the heart rate. And then don't forget about some of the hormones we've talked about, epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, from the adrenal gland, from the medulla section of the adrenal gland. This is kind of your fight or flight scenario. These usually um, are released in response to physical activity, uh, excitement, stress, and um, they basically mimic what's taking place in the sympathetic nervous system. And so these are gonna increase your uh, heart rate and contraction. There's other uh, factors that affect cardiac output, including other hormones that we've talked about, such as aldosterone and ADH. Uh, remember, both of these help to retain body fluids. And so by doing that, that increases the blood volume, um, which would increase the, uh, the preload, and that increases cardiac output. ANP, remember that one is opposite of aldosterone and ADH because it helps to get rid of some extra sodium that decreases blood volume, and that's going to decrease your cardiac output. And of course, there's many other factors, physical factors, your age, your physical thickness, even body temperature, metabolism. There's many other factors that can have um, some contribution to cardiac output.